and welcome to Breeders Syndicate, where we explore the history of a clandestine scene through the eyes of the folks who lived it. I'm Matthew, owner of Riot Seeds. I'll occasionally be joined by my co-host Not So Dog, breeder and grower from Mendocino. Welcome to the underground. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Breeder Syndicate. I'm Howdy. Matthew. This is my co-host, Notso. I know he's been out for a few weeks. Everybody's demanded, missed my friend Notso. And here we are with our friend Direwolf, who is in shadow. And today we're going to talk about some of the Canadian scene and uh, some of his IPM techniques. I know we've been meaning to do a show on IPM and needing to, and it's been heavily requested. And this man uh, has a lot of experience with it. So welcome, Direwolf. Thank you. I'm kind of happy to be on the on the black screen with all the critique. Not so it gets on his hair because I'm having kind of a bad hair day today. Yeah, you've seen how they bust his balls over his hair. It's brutal. <laughs> it is. I mean, yeah, you know, facial expressions, random stuff you don't even think of, they pick up on, and all of a sudden it's a meme or something. So yeah, the verbal tics. Sure. <laughs> yeah, the verbal tics. It's hard being a public speaker. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. You know, you don't really realize it until you listen to yourself, and then you're like, oh man. Wait, yeah, wait until you're staring at yourself in a long selfie for an hour. It's really, it's really interesting. Yeah, and so, I, anyone that knows, anyone that knows me in real life knows that I'm not like a big. I kind of have like a bit. I'm known for like my death stare. I'm like I look I look friendly when I'm smiling, but I, I have a death stare a lot of the time. So it doesn't <laughs> translate well over over uh, phones sometimes too. Well, we're, we're super glad to have you. Um, I wanted to start out talking a little bit about your your early introduction into the import scene in Canada. Let's start there. Um, what was it like? What kind of stuff were you seeing? Um, and what years are we talking about? Um, yeah, so I guess now that I think of it, I actually, my original start was actually a weird start. It was actually one of my, when I first started, was exposed to it, it was actually from a friend, one of my, just a guy from down the street's mom, who was, we found out later, was like a full on like closet grower. She was kind of like this hippie lady and we used to it was her boyfriend that actually got us like started smoking weed and then we'd always just jack her weed out of her bedside table and there was a big story that went with it about where it was and it was this exotic import and it turned out afterwards it was just she was literally one of the first growers around our area um growing it all in the backyard right in front of us and we had no idea so but basically that my so my first start was with homegrown and then but there really wasn't much weed going around back then it was really all import Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the years. I, st I started really, I started smoking when I was like 14. So I was probably like 86 or something like that. Yeah. And yeah, like for and basically in Canada until like you got a little bit of domestic stuff, but pretty much from those mid, like mid eighties until oh, it was like early nineties, there wasn't much domestic at all. Like, cause we didn't get any of like that. There was not a lot of outdoor and stuff. It was just the occasional indoor and you couldn't even really sell it. It was, it, you basically had to, like, I can totally remember people growing indoor and pressing it into bricks and selling it because it was the only way you could actually um, sell it. Like you couldn't, people wouldn't buy it. They, um, they so just didn't kinda, recognize it or? Uh, pardon me? Did they not recognize it as cannabis because it looked so different and not compressed or what was the reason? Uh, well, it was green was one thing. And, and the, you no, know, back then it was just, people didn't recognize it. It was possible to grow good wheat. They thought it was really, it had to be imported. And keep in mind, this is like yeah. back in like really, you know, so this would be right around the time where Neville was like launching the seed bank. So there probably yeah. wasn't a whole lot of like genetics. And I mean, if you even just put in perspective, if you fast forward four or five years later, I bought my first grow light and that was the only grow store in our entire province. So like the equivalent of your state, we literally had to drive like three hours to buy a, buy a halide light. There was only, there was literally only one store. So, I mean, it really wasn't a thing. So I mean, uh, go ahead. Oh, what's, I just remind, it was wild when, uh, when Matt and I interviewed <clears throat> Carell from Super Sativa Seed Club, uh, he had a similar story of when they first started growing indoor uh, they tried to brown it out because all this lime green and green color was like a real issue in the market because everyone was used to like imported brown and they had yeah, never seen sure. it. It was like an issue. Like green was an issue. Like people didn't realize it is better. They just saw it as something completely unusual. If you read that, I read a book by the, one of the guys from the cornbread mafia and that was pretty much their entire curing technique was trying to figure out how to make it brown and crappy looking so it looks like import. That was literally like everything. They like threw it on the barn floor and 
it was it was uh, for sure a thing. And the other thing, the area where I came from, it was very, very hash centric. So people didn't even really like buying weed. It was all like it was all like Afga- mostly that Afghani border hash. It was around and that was like the staple and everything else other than black Afghani hash was totally suspect. So most of it was import from Afghanistan then, as opposed to like uh, Mexican, like we were getting in the U.S. It wasn't really making its way up to Canada. I never actually saw Mexican until Dead Tour in like Ohio or something like that. And uh, I, you guys had a wholly different language because I remember like looking at it and going like, this. someone was selling it to me. I was like, this looks like really crappy. And he's like, it's mids, yeah. dude. And yeah. I was like, what are, what are mids? I don't know. All we knew was hash and, and high-end hydro <laughs> in Canada. Um, but yeah, I know it was, it was all... It was you'd get some other stuff, but it definitely wasn't the same type of import you're talking about. It was pretty much ninety percent of it was all like that Afghan, you know, like the gold stamps, a lot of it, the stuff you see yeah. Afghan, it's like border hash. And then you got occasional batches from Morocco or Lebanese, and then you got some weed, but it was usually pretty high end. Like it was like tie stick occasionally and we got a lot of like pressed jamaican and i don't think i i think i've maybe seen mexican like one time in canada ever i'm sure it was around how did you guys used to use the hash like actually smoke it was it the the old knife hits or like a jar so the area i'm from is this like tells you exactly it's one of those things anywhere you go in the world and everyone would be like what like but in our area like even the kind of the equivalent of like you know all of new york state this was well, like in the kind of it was a, it was an Ontario thing. So I grew up around Toronto area, and they did what was called bottle tokes, which they are horrible when I think back. But it's like you get a cigarette and you put a little piece of hash on it, and then you break a hole in the bottom of like a pop bottle, and you okay. like brew you brew brew the hash in there. And there's this whole technique, and then you kind of tip it over when it's done, and it's like a lava lamp, and then you suck the hash. Out, but there was like a whole like you, you were it was like you got social status in a lot in, well, in my circles anyways for like being a good bt brewer like it was like an art form being able to break the bottle it was kind of when you look back it was like pretty cracky but uh that was and you'll never hear anyone in canada know have a clue what you're talking about unless they grew up around toronto area and That's then everyone crazy. knows what you're talking about bottle I mean, you want to say you want to say cracky you look at some of the equipment now for dabbing i mean it just looks like straight meth pipes to me you know <laughs> it's just yeah all meth deck. <laughs> yeah i'm not in, i'm not i kind of avoid some of those um even though i kind of like dabs i don't dab a whole lot because i just hate the whole thing and my wife can't walk by a dab brick without accidentally breaking it so it's like an expensive <laughs> hobby yeah i never got into the whole torch thing like that was just too much too much too much to screw up, too much to do all of that. Once they started getting to like e-nails and shit where you could just leave it and set it, that was okay. It still felt a little cracky, but puff goes and stuff. Then it was like, okay, this looks like more like a bong. I can deal with this. You know? yeah. I feel like every two or three years in the hash movement right now, they all kind of like just move on from whatever they did before that they were convinced was the bee's knees. Yeah. And it just slowly gets dust binned. Like we're not going to talk about that era anymore that we did that. Um, But it's interesting. One of the things that I'll say about that is that, you know, I grew up in uh, in northern in Chicago. Right. And so even though Dire Wolf and I aren't like too terribly, terribly far from each other, uh, vastly different weed cultures. Yeah. You know, my weed culture was primarily Mexican, green and brown, and there was almost no hash culture. So it's interesting how like, you know, Canada and the different uh, laws and rules that applied over there led to vastly different imports that we saw um, i think it's also what what crime networks were working there because i think the big thing if you go and from canada east to west was totally different and so basically what was going on in our area was montreal which is like there's the port that's the big port that comes into canada from the east coast that was kind of controlled by by like irish mob, mafia and that was basically like a free, you could bring all kinds of stuff through there. So everything basically for the most part was coming through that court of Montreal. And what was the interesting thing about it? Um, we found out afterwards. So we kind of had like so when, up until like about 90 or something, it was all it was black Afghani hash. And then it kind of went dry for like a couple of years. And then a guy that I was good for, I was actually living with at the time. He had this connection. It was like this, this, uh, Irish mafia dude from Toronto 
And I remember we were like in university and he had, for whatever reason, nobody could get, and we found out afterwards what the actual story was, which is a crazy one. Nobody else had hash except for this guy. So we were like the Kings because we're the only guys that could get black hash, which is what everyone wanted. And we could get like however much you wanted. And this dude used to show up to our little like, you know, university student house every Friday night in like a limo and just bring like slabs of, of this hash in. And he's just like, one of those guys just didn't give a crap and he'd like walk out with a Ziploc full of cash. And it was like every Friday in and out. And what it turned out, I found out afterwards, it was the reason why they had access to this is it, it was actually Howard Marks old uh, stash. So Howard Marks would have been in jail at the time, but apparently he had, um, which if you ever read that Howard Marks book, he was yeah. up with the Irish dude, which kind of all makes sense. But apparently he got, when he went to jail, he had all these stash houses sitting all over Montreal still full. So they just sat on him for a while and then it started coming out through this. And that's why that's where our connect was. So it was all this kind of few year old uh, Howard Marks hash. And I might not be true, but I, th- I have a feeling it probably was, which probably tells you a whole lot of that. Hash. And I've heard of similar overlapping stories about where all that hash came from in Montreal. And so it was probably that's why everyone was smoking black Afghani hash. It was probably because there were like one or two major importers that were controlling that whole thing. I remember the the Nordal story um, from Neville talking about Nordal and one of his partners, and I think one of Mark's partners. That that was that was one of Mark's partners that had the Nordal thing, right? Yeah, it was. was, was Yeah, that was their whole deal, right? It was a guy that was part of the IRA, and he smuggled they would smuggle hash through the IRA networks telling them that it was guns. That was kind of their whole, that was how it marks his partner. Yeah. Super gangster for back then. What's interesting about all that too, is that there was a lot of, of hash smugglers that avoided America because the penalties were so much worse. Um, And, you know, they, they viewed America as sort of like the place where you went to prison for a long time where Europe and Canada and other places were viewed as like a lot chiller if you actually got in trouble. Yeah. You know, so I I remember they increased increased some of the charges here. If I remember during 215, I remember uh, like there were, there were bigger charges for hash or extracts than there were for uh, normal cannabis, you know, cannabis flower. At one point I remember it was getting really bad where like, at one point I was pulled over on the way to this, I was like some hash event in LA. And it was like, I stopped, I was like 4 AM. I pulled over to get gas on my way out of San Diego. And I didn't have a license at the time that suspended. And of course I got pulled over like cops sitting in the gas station waiting for me, you know, like no one else is there. They were bored. And, uh, they, they messed with me super hard over the hash. They were like, you know, we can get you for this though. You know, like, so they, they still took it seriously here during two fifteen. Um, oh yeah. Concentrated cannabis. Yeah. Yeah. Manufacturing and all. Did so, you get different grades of how, how would you, I mean, I know memory can be tough, but like, did you think the Afghani hash you were getting back then was high quality? Um, so it was mixed. So there was, yeah, there was different grades. I would say that we didn't necessarily know they were different grades. Um, but basically, so a lot of it, there was basically three grades from what I could tell there was, and it was just, there was different batches and probably the loads were mixed up. And a lot of the times back then, unless you're buying the whole kilo, which when we were like, you know, 15, you weren't getting, um, you weren't seeing what the stamp was on it. Um, so basically it all came in. If you ever see the packs, it's, it's, uh, they all came pretty much all came in this red cellophane paper uh, wrap. And some of them would have gold seals, like, which is, you know, probably gold spray paint with whatever brand of whatever, <laughs> just like you see with the Moroccan yeah. and, or you see with the modern yeah. day hash. And, uh, and we had all, it seems like all the best stuff would always had no stamp. And from what I understand, I think that probably was the case. And it was kind of like the good loads, um, like the stamp stuff was the commercial stuff and some came through that was kind of like the dealer hash and it just got each person's hand it went through that you know that guy would take the good stuff which was not stamped i don't know i from that 100 percent, but there was definitely and sorry and then there was kind of the third grade which kind of if you talk to some people they're like it was all crap and that was what was called repress and i don't know what the heck they did to it but like it was all controlled i think by the bikers on the kind of street level and somewhere along the lines 
um, Bubble Man actually saw what they did once because he was telling me, and I, I still don't really understand what it was, but it was some type of thing where they would just, it was cut with something and it was like a really noticeable, like the texture was different. But most of the stuff that we were getting was kind of really high grade or a lot of it was kind of just like medium, but it was pretty good. Um, and it, it's interesting now, it's a weird thing with legalization in Canada now is now we actually have a really thriving import hash scene again on the black market. So there's like websites you can go in Canada that have like the biggest hat import hash selection you've ever seen. And they're legit. Like I've tried a bunch of them and, but it's exactly the same. Like people say, Oh, it used to be so much better back then. It's literally exactly the same as what we used to got. Yeah. That's crazy. So what, what kind of years did the um, Afghani plants in the indoor scene start popping off in your area? Like when you noticed this started to become a normal uh, happenstance thing to get, to go to someone's house and they had to grow. Uh, we were pretty like on the, like my crowd was, that was, it was going on before that. But so I was in, it was probably like about, it was er, really early nineties, like probably like 92, 93, maybe 91. Um, that we were literally like, so I went to kind of like the agricultural and agricultural university. And that was like, it had some of my crowd kind of were the first people i'm sure other people had grown but we were really one of the first people that really started rocking it out and yeah. it was so it was not common at all like i said when i went to university that was the year that i bought like my first grow light which was probably like 91 or something mm -hmm. and yeah like there wasn't many people doing it and um and it was super like we were really some of the only people in town like everyone our crew kind of everyone was like knew who we were or heard of us because we were the guys with the genetics and that was pretty much so it wasn't a whole lot going around going on i don't think it was kind of a lot of scenes like that of like i'm sure we weren't the only people in town but there wasn't very many when you say the genetics what kind of stuff were you first growing for your indoors your first indoors uh my first indoor was well we i sorry our very first one we were actually growing import because everyone had like saved all their seeds so the first real real grow we did was I don't even know what it was. It was literally just like one of my roommates hit all the seeds he saved for like 10 years. We popped and they were all um yeah pretty equatorial and hermy and nothing great. I think we made it all into brownies. And then where our where our kind of big break came is one of my friends was he had gone on dead tour to the West Coast and he ended up living on some commune. I think it was in I can't remember if it was in Seattle area or, or Portland area I believe it was down in Portland around Oregon and uh and he's who came he came back and kind of taught all of our crowd to grow so that's kind of how I I learned was from this dude and he had just learned from living on this commune um weirdly growing blueberry indica is what he that was before DJ Short was even around and he would always wow. talk about blueberry indica back yep. then but that's not what we were growing so we were so he taught us to grow and he just had some old stuff from like ssc and uh the seed bank so he had it was mostly skunk one what we were growing and then i also did i did a lot of skunk number one and i also did a lot of haze just because that happened to be the seeds we had was a silver pearl or a, not a silver pearl a silver silver haze line yeah. Yeah. it was something silver pearl by haze together. yeah is that what it was? I thought it was something different, but for some reason. But anyway, no, it was man. like a haze C of some kind. So I, I have this like thing where I like try to d uh, discover uh, all the names that Sensi changed, right? And sometimes Matt, you know, it's like a hobby or whatever. And so one of the interesting parts is when when Sensi bought Neville's Seed Bank, they wanted to obscure how much of it was just a direct port over from the Seed Bank itself. So they ended up changing a bunch of names, right? Uh, but the big clue um, with Silver Haze was that they, in Sensi, they claimed in the Silver Haze advertisement in the in the book that it won the eighty nine, it won the overall eighty nine Cannabis Cup. So you go look at what won the eighty nine Cannabis Cup, and it's Silver Pearl by Haze from Neville. <laughs> they, had, they had to put it in there i mean you got to get yeah, the cup okay. advertisement in yeah there, it, you know? it, so that that was actually like a really helpful piece of information because we actually have like uh we have photos of the old of the old magazine spread and it's right there you know so it started out as like early pearl by skunk one by nl5 by Hayes. yeah 
and then well, it got that's changed. That's what I to originally silver. thought it was, and then I thought yeah. somebody had said it was an Ortega or something. So I, I was thinking maybe that, but I, I, I originally had thought what you're saying. So, so you're right too. There's this weird thing where Neville used to call uh, a maple leaf by uh, he crossed Afghan tea to haze as well, and he called that silver haze. But I don't think he actually ever sold it. I think he kept it private. And that's so, one of the ones that Shanti uses a lot now, if I'm correct. Is, yeah. Uh, is, is is a, days, from seed, from seed at least. Yeah. So yeah, he yeah. crossed when he, the first two things that he crossed Hayes, you know, to, it was Afghan T and NL5. And NL5 obviously got released and became the super popular thing. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the 89 Cannabis Cup winner, Silver Pearl by Hayes. So that's a good one. Yeah, it was yeah. a weird one to start with. Like we start when we had no idea. It was just the only genetics we had. So we were running all this haze. And it wasn't super long flowering. Like they were, they were, I think we, cr I crossed it. That was kind of the first kind of messing with genetics that I really did is I crossed just because that's what we had. I crossed some of that silver haze with like a, a skunk number one. And we kind of had like this seed line that we kept popping for a, a long time just because it was the only genetics we had. And it was, it was weird because it was actually really similar to like that sweet skunk that, that I grow now and it, that's partly why I grow it. It totally like reminds me of like 1993 or whatever, when we were growing these uh, silver haze crosses. I can see that being really good though. Like a, a skunk one silver pearl haze, like that would be pretty legit. I would think like uh, it would be fast flowering, probably have good bud structure, good resin production. All, all Relatively good. fast. It was Relative. like 70 days, and then we were probably picking it too early back then. And it was probably 70 or 75 days, I would I would think. Yeah. But it was it, it yielded, but it wasn't, yeah, it wouldn't have been like a great cash cropper. And then the other weird one that you never that I've never most like I said, most of the stuff you see back then, I'm like, it's still pretty similar to what stuff like there's a lot of stuff now that's pretty similar to it. The one that I've never seen that was like it is we used to have this Durban, which for sure it was one of my buddies brought it back from Sensi. And, uh, and it was, to I've never seen anything like that. It was really, like, it could quite well have had an indica in it, but it didn't look, because it kind of, it was, like, finished really quick, and it kind of had a short stature, but it was, like, this really weird, like, full-on sativa, but with really dark leaves, and, uh, and that it totally had that, this crazy, like, anise taste, like, you hear people say, with dirt it wasn't super potent but it was definitely like pretty unique and it was one of the better tasting weeds that i've ever had and i've tried a bunch of durban since and i've never seen anything remotely like that one yeah i don't really see the the anise durban at all ever and like you hear these tales of this this beautiful sensi durban and you just it did for some reason the the terpinaline one seems to be the one everybody kept that just seems to be what i run into you know yeah this was 100 percent just like anise there was like no doubt about it but that's what it was that's really cool. I mean, it, it's certainly a shame um, because we're talking about things, re re realistically speaking, that aren't that that long ago. But the nature of prohibition kind of means that like was, you know, you could have something that was common and five or 10 years go by and all of a sudden it's just disappeared. Yeah. You know. So talk I mean, about some of your early crosses, dude. Like you, you talked about the skunk one by Silver Haze. Was there any other ones that you were doing doing early on that you found success in or weird stuff in? Um, I did. We did a bunch. There was one that we can go go into a bit, but honestly, like I didn't. The, you were so. I've always been like I'm pretty big on like not messing around unless you can pop some decent amounts of like numbers. Yeah, and you can never really pop that many that much for numbers. So the only one. So I did kind of. So I played around early and then for a big part of when I was growing, I just kind of got out of it because I was so worried about plant count all the time. The last thing yeah. I wanted to be doing was like popping males and, and stuff like that. But the one, so the one I think I told you guys about where I was joking that maybe it was the, uh, the purple Urkel precursor. That was the only one yeah. that I ever did that was kind of got pretty famous. And it was, uh, at the time there was no, there was really no purple weed. And I had gone to Amsterdam and brought back, uh, we went to Positronics and I brought back a bunch of stuff. And one of them was a strain called Purple Star. Purple which was Star. Like, yeah. 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 Well, they don't, I don't think it's even, I don't know if that's even a thing in Holland, but they used to be, they have all these different purple strains that were for outdoors. Yes. That were Dutch yep. Passion had and Pos Posi had and probably a couple others. And anyways, I brought that back and it was like actually a pretty good yielder. It didn't, it wasn't really very good quality. But it, it looked decent and it was like a total novelty. It was like super purple. Yeah. So I had crossed that to 
uh, we had like a skunk number one cross with Hindu Kush and I crossed it to this purple star and we actually got some pretty nice ones that were kind of like way, way nicer than the purple star. Like they were kind of indoor quality. Yeah. And, uh, and we had that and I gave my old partner at the time he had moved out West, um, to kind of like our little humble, which is like the Kootenays, which is like Nelson, BC. And he had moved out there and he, before he left, he grabbed a whole crap load of those seeds. And I don't know if it was the Hindu skunk uh, purple star, or if it was that, I think it was actually that it was mixed with that crossed with a, an Aurora indica, which was a Northern light strain that Posse yeah. had. Yeah. And it was, he popped like quite a lot. Like he popped like a hundred or two of those and got this one that they called they just called it papaya and it was like this really nice uh purple it was kind of like checkerboard purple pattern Mm -hmm. and these guys were like big they were like ballers like so they were doing they were in like the export crowd and uh and that clone just totally blew up um and for a while so in bc there's kind of like everyone always talked whenever most people that you hear talk they're always talking about like coastal bc like vancouver area if you go inland with 10 hours there's this is where the kootenays are and that's where our real like that's where the real players go so for a while for like a couple of years there was a that was like one of the most popular clones being grown there was this papaya thing and that's why i was uh joking because when when uh, not so was saying they used to call urkel uh the barney and that's what the buyers used to call this stuff was the barney but it was probably what that years was what years was that that would have been like I would think it was probably like late, like late nineties, like somewhere between like 98 and 2000 probably. Because the interesting part about the, um, you know, a lot of the purple cuts that became famous uh, in Northern California and, and kind of in our scene is that there's a lot of like people that claim things to, you know, uh, about them, but there's very little like uh, verifiable fact. Yeah. Right. Um, which is unusual for a strain strains that got that famous to stay that obscure for that long. Um, and there's a lot of competing things and there's, there's actually a guy in Mendo, I won't mention his name, but there was a, there was kind of a a kooky guy in Mendo who claims, uh, that he went up to BC, uh, and ended up, uh, smuggling clones back taped to his thigh uh in cigar in cigar cases like in cigar you know like Like cigars like the tubes yeah Yeah. the tubes um and he taped him to his thigh this is pre when pre before osama ruined flying yeah um you know when uh you know when airport security got a lot rougher after 2001 Um, but pre to that uh it was a lot looser and he he swears to god that he brought these clones from uh from bc uh, down to Mendo. Hmm. Um, just, and, just to be super clear, I'm not making any claims to Purple Urkel. I'm just joking. That no, I get it. No, I, believe me. <laughs> well, th- that's the thing, right? Is that there are people that will tell you with absolute certainty that this is what it is. Yeah. And then you start poking around in it, and it be and there's holes and this and that. Um, it's one of the few things that that with Purple Urkel, with Grape Ape, with. Uh, lavender and things like that there really isn't a settled story yeah that everyone believes there's some competing stories and there's ones that like we're pretty sure aren't true um but you know for for as famous as it was and as big of an issue as it was in california for a while um most of those most of not all but most of those purple cuts the origins are still kind of a mystery it was it's cool that you mentioned purple star um Purple Star is actually one of the baselines of purples for, for purple number one, for Shaman, for a lot of the Dutch purples all came from that purple. Is it related one. to Viking? Uh, I think I, I, I think I they think. all probably came from Viking because I think Viking kind of predates those. And they were all pretty, I think they were definitely related because we got that cream sodica you hear about yeah, that yeah. was totally out of that same family. Um, they just, you look at them, you're like, that's one of those old crappy purple Dutch outdoor streams. Positronics about a year and a half ago, they they went into their their uh, library of mom seeds, or their their parent seeds and whatnot, and they were kind enough to take me out the parentage of Purple Star, whatever they used to make it, 
and they sent me the seats, but they disappeared on the way here. I was so bummed because I was like, I finally get to look at the parents of Purple Star. Like most people wouldn't be that stoked about it because it's kind of boofy and you know. It would be. Time, it's interesting to me. It would be really funny, honestly, if if there an element of that story is true because, um, you know, coming being in California, uh, when this is fast forwarding a bit, so we can go back after, but. Um, one of the things that really made the purple craze in like 03, 04, 05 really take off was that California was getting flooded by, uh, you know, beat by Canadian indoor. Yeah. And once brokers learned that the Canadian indoor was so much cheaper than California homegrown, they started buying it and trying to pass it off as California homegrown and making massive margins. And a lot of it was pretty midsy, you know, it was just, it wasn't flushed right. It was grown with too high EC. It was yeah, packaged. They were their best down here. You yeah. Know? Well, and it, you well, know, yeah. it was, it was also, it was sealed in a, in a vacuum sealer, you know, so it kind mm -hmm. of fermented a little bit like in, in transport, not that there wasn't some good stuff coming down, but a lot of it was bad. And one of the things in California, especially in the Bay that started the purple craze was that the purple wasn't Canadian. Like it was homegrown, you know, and you knew it was from California because people were getting bunked by buying weed for 4,400 that was Canadian that these guys were buying for two grand Yeah, and making the difference, you know? So it was like, that was one of the things that started the purple craze uh, in NorCal was uh, there wasn't any BC coming down that was purple at the time. And so it was like a... It was marketing. Yeah, it was early marketing, honestly. And and 215 had opened up in California enough that once it got into the clubs and once, you know, popularity spiked, then it just was rolling and it was a it was a marketable thing. I so, do think the Be the Beasters guys got a little bit of a bad rap just for, you know, that all the good stuff that went down just got called and passed humble. And nobody questioned I'm it, right? sure. and all the and all the crap stuff just got mm -hmm. hey, all this Beasters. So and I think they did sell. They definitely did. I'm not disputing. There was a lot of beasters got uh, shipped down i think we actually probably kept the worst beasters up here because if you go the kind of backstory of like the commercial market here was always this cut called m39 which is like yeah i can't imagine anybody ever exported that but maybe they did and it was like this it was probably just m39 from ssc which i think was yeah. a skunk nl and it yeah. was just this rock hard orange like like they probably literally cut them at 39 days or something and i mean it was still to this day the worst weed i've ever smoked ever Freedom 39. Ever. you know you know what's so funny <laughs> about that standard. man is that these days um people most people who smoke weren't around back then and so there are a bunch of people that are you know there are some people out there that are they're touting that they have m39 and I've breeding seen, I've into seen things. That. Red <laughs> no, dog. I've seen that Red dog's one who's bringing yeah. back the and, m39 yeah. and and you know there's an aspect of it because most people all they remember is the name yeah you know all they remember is the name one I thing i wanted to it. ask you before i forgot is that yeah. um when you were on uh you know before I, before you and I had even chatted, you had posted this picture uh, on your IG of this old Northern Lights clone. Um, yeah, that was the first one I ever posted on IG. Yeah, and I was wondering, and that to me, um, I would just want, you know, if you could expound on that cutting a little bit, because I remember it where you were like, oh, you know, this is from the late 80s. It, it descends from the seed bank era. We lost it, but it was a staple for, you know, 20 plus years. Yeah, that was the closest thing in my crew that was I would consider like a long like our crew was like I said it was pretty rough so people didn't really keep cuts around and they were all chasing most of my I I was never like super big into the commercial scene but a lot of my friends were like big like they were heavily into the commercial scene so they were chasing just no different than today everyone's chasing whatever the newest gelato crosses or something they were chasing whatever was hypey so they never kept anything and this and that specific nl clone was around our crew for a long time and it originally came from that same guy i was talking about before that the papaya clone came from I mean, he was kind of like my original partner when we were younger like we got started together we're still good friends today 
And he was always like in the thick of things. So that was, he was kind of my, one of my kind of main connections because he hung out with some people I had zero interest in hanging out with, but they always had good genetics and stuff. And he had brought it at, back out from uh, Nelson um, and it had, they had gotten it there from one of my friend's dads who lives just outside of Vancouver, a place called Squamish. And yeah, that one we could definitely trace back because it was literally like, I know the guy it came from and it was like his dad and it was from whatever, like I don't remember 87 or something like that. It was right around like that time period. And that one was totally, it looked just like a lot of the NLs that we've grown, but it totally had a completely different terp profile and was way, way frostier. Like that was the first plant I'd ever seen that had like, if you grew it right, that picture doesn't probably do it justice. If you grew it right, it was one of those ones that had kind of like, remember on the white widows where the resin went like right to the end of like the sugar leaf, like, Mm -hmm. or even part on the fan, it did that. And it was uh, just crazy terps. Like I remember the one guy, uh, one of my friends that used to move a lot of it and you like, it would just, he used to keep it in his freezer and you'd crack the freezer and just like his whole house would smell. And I've, it's, it was a really unique terp profile that I honestly can't even put a finger on. I kind of wonder whether it's maybe when um, Neville talks about those juniper flavors, it was maybe that, but it was like, it was a weird, like kind of out of spacey type of uh, flavor that I've never really had since. And, but that one was definitely like around our crowd for a long time. Cause I remember like not keeping it and then being, man, I really want that or someone to be asking for it. And I'd go find it. And I could always like a friend of a friend's brother had that. We just called it the NL clone. And it made ridiculous hash and it made ridiculous amounts of hash because it was kind of pretty leafy. So you got a lot of trim. But I remember just pulling like, I can't remember what the ratio was, but just giant honks of hash off that all the time. I was trying I'm to always in- a picture of it for so everybody could see it. But it's I'm always interested in that kind of stuff because we have so few pictures that survive of a lot of those original strains. Um, and especially like, you know, ones that people found in those lines. Um, and some lines we have a few pictures and other lines, you know, it, it's kind of a mystery. Um, and I have it saved just because, you know what it reminds me of? And it's not exact because I know it's a hybrid, but the way that it's super frosty and the way that the top crowns, it kind of reminded me of Bubba. I can yeah, I find all the NLs remind me of Bubba. Like, so with the other ones that we had. There it is. I guess right we- there. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that that just reminds me, not exactly because Bubba's a hybrid or whatever, but like it just reminds me of like that, especially when Neville would talk about like a single cola, kind of small, you know, like almost yellowish at times, very resinous, uh, short Afghan. Um, it really it really matches up well with his description of what his NL was. Yeah, it definitely. might even grown slower than Bubba. <laughs> It was a really super, it was the squattest plant I've ever grown. And I think because it was so old, it had really lost a lot of vigor, but it was brutal. And I remember at the time we had like this really strong plant count. So this was kind of late when I was growing it. And I used to grow it as trees into like a vertical scrog setup. There were six feet, so six feet tall trees into like a scrog. And it was just took for freaking ever to get it up to size. And uh, And I actually used to, I used to actually spray it with a, really low doses of gibberellic acid just to make the inner oh, stretch wow. like during the during the veg time yeah that's an old trick for for squatty ones that's cool so what kind of turf profile did you say it had like, like I, honestly to- i could i it doesn't compare to anything i've tried now like it, i would say it was no stronger like it was similar to a lot of the modern stuff but i mean it's not in flavor but in like strength of terps so it probably had you know probably at least three percent terps which was on, but if you compare it to what was going around back then, like that was, it was totally another level than most stuff going around back yeah, then. It, kind of, it was a weird, it almost had a little bit of a, it was really hashy, but it really had kind of like there was some fruit, like almost like a grapey tone to it. But it was just, it was one that I, it's kind of like, I would, it was just really hard to describe. It was kind of like, oh, gee, there was a lot of stuff, weird stuff. Um, going in there but that's honestly when i look back that's one of the few that i've like oh that would that one would still be cool to have and it would be novel now that it's something that nobody else um nobody else has i don't think it was necessarily better than anything that's around now but it would hold it's it would still hold 
pulled its weight compared to like modern stuff, which I would say most of the stuff from that era definitely wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, what what year did it end up uh, kind of fading out and go missing? Uh, it would have been the exact one. If you look at when Stephen Harper became prime minister of Canada, that I was the last guy holding it. And I got rid of it when he came in because he put all these crazy mandatory minimums and I couldn't hold my uh, cuttings. I'm thinking it was probably like 2003 or something like that. 2004. That's a shame. It's gone. That is a shame. Yeah, they, they had it literally down to, I think you're going to go to jail for five years for five plants or some mandatory minimum. So I, that was the time when I was like, okay, like breeding and keeping lots of mothers kind of went out the uh, window under, under that dude. And since we're, uh, since we're on that, that sort of era subject, I have another uh, IG post you made that I wanted to chat about, which was um, I went out to the cannabis cups in the late nineties, a few times. Um, and one of the things I brought back, which I wish I still had seeds of was the first year that they released Neville's haze. Um, and I think it's actually one of the first things you and I chatted about, uh, was you posted these pictures of some old Neville's haze grows. Uh, and I, I think, think you got that, you got that Neville's haze right around that same era, right? The late nineties. Uh, it was, I think it was 2000. So it wasn't right when they, it was the first round of seeds that I got, but it had been around for a little bit. Um, but I, I remember exactly when it was because it was, uh, I'm pretty sure it was right around, it was like 99 or 2000. And it was I think it got that. released in 98. So that's basically like the very first era of it. Yeah. Yeah. It was when I first decided I kind of got out of like the, whatever, I was just branched out and was like, you know what, I'm just going to try growing some different stuff and I don't really care if whatever, if it looks nice and stuff. So I just started playing around with a lot of different plants and, and that was one. So I started doing some hazes and that was, uh, one of the ones I think actually how we started talking was actually Ortega because I yeah, threw out a lot that, of that uh, too. Maple leaf indica um, as well. But um, yeah, that Neville's haze was, that was a learn, the learning lesson, but that was pretty, uh, I grew out, I think I had like, I think I had three packs of that and I grew them, uh, grew them all out. I actually got some, most of it was pretty jungly weed, but I mean, it was crazy strong, like just, like the extracts on that stuff were just scary and yeah that's the picture right there um but i actually one of the cooler plants i've ever grown came out of that pack it was one that looked full-on like sati like really haze structure and the buds were little were dead on like nl5 miniature little pine cone buds but they were literally like half a centimeter long kind of like little sativa <laughs> buds but they were rock hard little indica things and they were literally like look like little candies or something. It was still one of the most bizarre hybrid expressions I've ever seen. It tasted like had that kind of incensey taste. It definitely leaned more towards the NL5, but it was a cool, uh, cool plant. Yeah. One of the things, so one of the things I liked about your description of it was I think you nicknamed one of those cuts party slayer yeah. because the high made so many people uncomfortable. It would like kill the vibe when you brought it. Yeah, so we had at the time there was one of my friends was had the he lived just kind of an hour or so north of Toronto, and in this kind of pretty small town, it was like I know it's tiny, it was like probably thirty thousand, and he used to sell most of the weed to like the twenty something year olds crowd there, and we had a batch of we just ended up having too we were just growing it for like hobby stuff, and we ended up having too much every once in a while. So, so some of this Neville's haze would end up going into like the commercial market with no, there was no names back then. Right. So we'd just sell this crappy looking weed <laughs> and my buddy would, would uh, sell it in. And everyone, I think, I think we were having, all right, which is, I, I don't remember the story, but it was, it looked like crap and everyone was like thinking it was swag and uh, yeah, they would all puff that stuff. And I, that was no, we had a bad batch that didn't burn well. So they were all like really huffing on it, trying to get the thing to burn properly. And then they, and no idea. And, you know, it's got like a 20 minute creep on it. So they would all be trying to, you know, puffing furiously on this doobie to try and get it to burn properly. And uh, I think the nutrients just got mixed up because the, you know, we weren't used to growing like 16 weeks of Tevas and stuff. And, uh, and then everyone would get like super, super high. And uh, and then the whole party would end, and that was it. Became like legend for like a year or so. There was all this Neville's haze getting dumped into the. So it was like they were literally that dude. You literally used to sell like M thirty nine, which you could basically not get high off of. A little bit of that NL, and then this the no burn, 
the no burn uh, the party, party slayer weed. Yeah, <laughs> and you were telling me a story too. I think about like your friends that were in construction and they got too high to even come off the roof. Oh they yeah, I forget, yeah. So I used to have this one friend who was one of the heaviest uh, smokers you'll ever meet, and he always used to like. Uh, you know, you got like super killer weed and most people back would be like, holy cow, like that was so good. And you could never phase Don. Like Don was just, I, you could give him like the, you know, that bub- bubble hash from that crazy Northern Lights clone. I gave him once thinking this was going to blow him away. And he just like did this massive like dab of it and was just like, eh, it's, a, it's okay. Like nothing would phase this dude. And uh, him and one of his buddies had a roofing company and they I hadn't seen him for like a year or so i'd moved away from town and uh i needed a new roof on my house so and i had this one of the, like a really steep roof that was a little treacherous to be walking around and before they went on to redo the roof he's like you got any weed so i had this uh neville's haze it was neville's haze mixed with neville's haze hash and it was like really strong this joint i probably did it purposely really strong just to try and phase dawn and uh they smoked it wasn't even that big of a joint they smoked this thing and i just thought nothing like because nothing ever phased this dude and then i was like where are those dudes like they've been up there for so long <laughs> and so i yelled up and they like stuck their head over the roof and they're like yeah we just got to sit it out up here for a while man <laughs> they, 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 were, they were up there for hours just tripping on this neville's haze hatch <laughs> i mean i i literally i have this clear memory of smoking what i would classify as a pinner of Neville's Haze uh, when I first tried it with two other people. So I probably only got three or four good hits off it before it was gone. And I have this clear memory in Amsterdam of like walking out of dude's house and like gripping the railing for the six steps down to the road, like gripping it with my life because I didn't want to fall. (laughs) <laughs> you know and like it messed with my equilibrium and like i was soaring high and I, it hit me in such an unusual way i could absolutely see like being like i am not fucking with that ladder at all yeah like there is no ladder in my future for a while i am just gonna <laughs> I sit fine. here where i'm at i'm gonna sit where i'm at and i'm gonna wait until the ladder makes sense because i have this memory of like like being like i can't go down these steps without this railing without assistance <laughs> yeah like i needed and i was like you know i was i don't know 23 or something like that and it was totally nice weather they were dry steps and i was like i wanted to make sure that i had a center when i walked down them yeah so it was definitely like the extract of so haze is like i always find haze like you can smoke if you smoke regularly like you smoke i find most people that you just get hit every once in a while like you can smoke haze and it's like just it's because i don't think it's super strong it just but it's when you just smoke a little bit too much which is a lot easier when you're smoking like a hash joint or something and it just you know creeps up on you and all of a sudden you're taking the you know the night bus downtown um but i have all the time i have people that smoke all the time that i'll give like that sweet skunk to and it doesn't look that great and they're used to smoking cookies and a lot of them have just never even smoked like proper haze and uh you always hear kind of similar stories where somebody just smokes every day is like what the heck was that (laughs) Because um, they don't, just got caught sideways by it. Maybe science will eventually tell you, but if you you can be like uh, very used to smoking a lot of like what we would consider high end strains these days, like chems and bubba's and you know and and ogs and different things. And there's an aspect to hazes where they just kind of hit you a bit sometimes, like you're a newbie and you don't have a tolerance. Yeah, no, yeah. for sure. It's nothing that I I generally. I maybe smoke a bit more now, but I remember back then I definitely couldn't smoke uh, hazes every day. Like I remember thinking I was like this, you know, weed snob. I'm like, oh, I only like hazes is the best. But if you looked at my jars, the Neville's haze sat there for a long period of time and the Northern Lights like went down real quick. So it was always more, it was more like a mild psychedelic for me, like smoking uh, Neville's haze yeah. hash. It could get in the way of your day. Yeah, for sure. You know, you could, you know, uh, most weed I can smoke and it enhances my day. But, you know, there's some weed and haze is one of them that can alter your day and send you on a completely different path than you were on before. It's crazy when you get not so or Tom Hill talking haze, you could get them doing this for hours at a time, waxing poetic endlessly about haze. Uh, I mean, the re- life change. I'll say this. Right. So that at that point, I had been going to Amsterdam for 
four or five years at that point, uh, generally at least once or twice a year. And most of the stuff that I got was not that great. I went through a lot of stuff and I tossed a lot of stuff. Some of the hybrids I made with some of the American stuff I had ended up much better. And I kind of had this opinion that, you know, uh, what we had was clearly superior. Uh, and then, uh, you know, those hazes, some of those haze hybrids that they have over there, that was the first thing where all of a sudden I was like, maybe these old timers tales of like soaring psychedelic Colombian that you get tracers in your vision and you're giggly and you have a hard time walking, which I kind of thought was bullshit up till that point. Um, all of a sudden I was like, oh, it's real. It might be rare, you know, but it's real. I've literally and, chased that high ever since I've had it. You know, the, the first time experiencing that. I think that's common with a lot of people. You know, you and get so, that psychedelic experience and that's... Well, some, for some people, too, it makes them want to crawl out of their skin. Yeah, yeah. You I, know, I, like it's not... It, it, it's, it's almost like a disassociative, very uncomfortable, like not used to it type of type of high. So it's, it's interesting in that regard. My you experience know? started out with the roller coaster paranoia... And by the end of the high is when the visual elements were started turning into a clear headed where you could see tracers with your, that, that is just a whole nother experience. Uh, so that's just why that's, that. that's why it sticks with me because like, like, uh, like Dyer Wolf was saying, like he's got an unflappable buddy that yeah. like would, be, would almost never give praise. And then the guy smokes a joint and doesn't want to use a ladder for hours. <laughs> I could honestly say he's never given praise ever, except for the Neville's haze. That's the only time I've ever seen anything haze that dude. That's funny. Yeah, so that I always like that story, you know, because he was like, "Oh no, uh, no, no, no ladder. I'm just gonna sit right here while I'm safe." So one thing that didn't make it over into the U.S. a lot that I that I personally am always interested about whenever I have anyone, any of my Canadian friends, I like talking about a little bit are the hash plants that made their way through uh, Canada, like the Rene, the Champagne. There were some other biker ones, if I remember correctly, uh, that, that were popular. Do you have much experience with those? Uh, not a ton. So I actually, I actually just, by coincidence, just picked up the Rene cut off a friend of mine last week, but I've never actually tried it. I've heard pretty mixed reviews on that, but it's it's got to be one of the – I was just talking to my friend about that when I got it. I was like, it's been around since at least, like, 93 or something like that so people like not a lot of stuff that gets held around that long but de there's definitely a lot of people like my friend is like i didn't think it was that good i've heard camara say he didn't think it was that good i don't know i never tried it the other ones were kind of so that was basically from what i can tell yeah that was like a group of bikers and those were kind of their elite biker cuts um like for sure that so the story is and again all this gets highly this is reefer man enters the picture so stuff gets a little uh, -oh. uh <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to separate yeah. facts from fiction because sure. he's very adept at mixing the two. I, that's what I always disliked about people like Reefer Man is he actually has a ton of great information. Oh, he sure. just mixes mixes it with a ton of bullshit, so you never know what's real. So he and he. So, anyways, the story that he has, which seems to kind of play out, is there's kind of like a group of bikers. Um, out on Vancouver Island um, that were doing a lot of runs back then um, mm -hmm. from seed. And the story is that it was import. It, it was seed from import, which I find high, hard to envision, but I guess maybe I've heard a bunch of different stories, but definitely I think they all for sure came out of like kind of either Vancouver Island or North of Vancouver or somewhere on coastal BC. And yeah. I think, Almost all of those came from the same group. There was like Champagne. That's when the ancestors of like Pink Kush, which was like King, uh, yeah. Queen. There was one called Jiffy Pot. Maybe even that uh, God Bud. I think they all came out of the same group. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, like Champagne, I only saw it in, I've never grown it. I've had it in flower form a couple of times and it was really early. Like I remember like it was like 93 or something like that when I went through and it was there was nothing else like it like it was super high-end yeah. weed for the time I don't think it's anything like super special it's just like a really nice hash plant um yeah. but a lot of the Canadian ones are kind of based around those that kind of group like if you look at like the special K pink kush um king's cross it used to be um there's a bunch of them that all they're kind of similar 
And it's kind of got a little bit obscured because what Reefer Man did is he cro- he took that King cut, which was one of the little legit OG, like original ones. Yeah. And he crossed it with a whole bunch of different stuff. So he crossed it with like a lot of like modern US stuff. Don't hold me to this, but I think it was like MK Ulcer, which is like an OG G13 yeah. cross. He crossed it with, I think, a San Fernando Valley OG seed line and a few other things. And if you look at it now, it's like, I don't know, is it real? So what goes around is so pink Kush. Everyone is like, oh, that's the old King cut. But yeah. I don't think it's actually necessarily the old King Cut. It's like it's crosses with the old King Cut to modern Kush varieties. And if I had to lay bets, it probably leans heavier towards like modern Kush varieties than the King. But I don't know. I've never grown the original one. But uh, had, they were I definitely had some of those seeds, the King seeds. And I, I think uh, when I was going to do a collab with Y East and Compound before I knew much about uh, Compound, he ended up with them. So somewhere there are King seeds still in existence. Don't know if they're across though. The white buffalo guys still definitely hold it. Like I've tried a few oh, wow. different hybrids out of it. Um, they definitely have all, a lot of those old cuts still. Like they definitely have the king. But I know yeah, they've, they've said they, they've told me that, or said to my buddy that uh, they're like the pink Kush that goes around now doesn't look anything like the king that they hold. And I mean, he used to be partners with Reef Man, so I'm sure he has the original king. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, he did a lot of that early work for Reef Man, Butterscotch Hawaiian which I, I ended up liking a lot. Um, I know Reefer Man always talked it down, but I loved it. Did you ever get to try that one over there? Uh, I generally, I did not. I generally avoided anything to do with Reefer Man. I'm sure he had good stuff. He's just Come one on of those me. people that just, I just, I just, his, his aura just passes through anything he touches for me. And I just don't want anything to do with it. I can appreciate that for sure. I, you know, there's a lot of lines like that that I didn't touch because of just the juju associated with it. You know, you never know. Some people have bad juju that just flows through everything they touch. I mean, you know, it's an issue in cannabis because uh, a lot of the people that end up doing a lot of work, uh, you start digging into them and you're like, oh, man, like we really attract our community attracts a lot of quirky. And some of that quirky is just quirky. And some of that quirky is like you're like, oh, man, yeah, uh, that's not that cool, uh, depending on your perspective. Um, but it. uh you know, one of the things, Dire Wolf, that like, I don't know if you you talked about this on the, the thing you just did, but Matt and I, we sort of had this this gig where we, we were doing like sort of like the histories of the seed banks and stuff. And we were going to do some stuff on Canada. And we ended up just not doing it because we both realized that neither one of us had enough of a base of actual information and history to like do it any justice, yeah. you know? Um, the characters involved, all that. I mean, Canada is definitely sort of what I consider to be like the third wave of seed banks. Um, you know, uh, in, not not just in terms of like seed brokers, um, but, you know, just whole groups of people all of a sudden coming up with, um, you know, seed banks themselves and blends of their own stuff and blends of European stuff. And there was a lot of that around for a while. It almost, almost dominated. Higher. Yeah, it's it did dominate for a while. It did yeah. dominate for a while, for sure. You know, Federation, uh, you know, Reefer Man, uh, was it Joey, you know, the islands. Um, there was a lot. There was a lot of yeah. uh, people up there. The one thing I would say about that that I think gets a little bit skewed, and not, not necessarily in a bad way, but all the, I would say, all pretty much entirely the history of kind of what was coming out of cannabis comes from a handful of people. It comes from Chimera, Breeder Steve, Red from Legends, and Reefer Man. Yeah. And maybe I'm maybe mixing a couple, but I mean, keep in mind those guys minus the Reefer Man, like Red, Chimera, Breeder Steve, they were all from like the same crew. So what they're talking about, when they talk about all this stuff, I'm like, that wasn't what was they, you know, if you listen to them and you're like, everyone was growing, you know, sweet tooth and <laughs> whatever they were yeah. doing. Legends Ultimate Indica. And I'm like, in my crowd, and I said some of my friends were pretty big rollers they weren't no, the only people that i was the only one that knew anything about that and i learned about it from the internet not from what was going on in canada and i think that gets a little bit skewed where i think they definitely were like a representative of what was going on but it, that was definitely it was definitely far more diverse than it sounds coming from those guys and i'm not saying they're being self-serving at anything i don't think they are i just think they're just telling their story and yeah. it was a small segment of what was going on and the other big thing there like i said is that divide where they're all talking about what 
kind of what's going on in lower mainland BC, which is like the Vancouver area or also Vancouver Island, yeah. where that other kind of can which there is definitely a lot of growing there. That's where the most of the population is. But that Kootenai Nelson area has always been like the real bread and butter of like the wood. That's our Humboldt. And, uh, and what was going on there still to this day, whatever's going, like you go like on the coast, it's all like everyone's growing pink kush. Pink kush has been dominating that scene for like a decade. And then you go to the Kootenays, nobody grows pink kush. They're all growing whatever, something totally different. Like it's a total, and that breeder Steve Kamara crowd was really like a coast of Vancouver kind of based group. And then, so there was other groups um, that were totally different. They were based out of the Kootenays. Um, but if you go back to those, you're talking about all those, most of those, I think pretty much all those Canadian seed companies, they were all from Mark Emery. Like, yeah, they were all getting Mark offered Emery through group. him. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's definitely, like, I think that Federation next generation, that Federation turned into next generation and that next yeah. generation guy's still around. I've never met him, but I think that guy gets underrepresented. I'm like, he's still like, he was one of the, most of those Romulan genetics I would, I would argue all of the Romulan genetics going around in the U.S. probably came from Next Generation and Federation Seeds. I would um, think so. But a lot of those ones that went through Emory were kind of just like not – I mean, that's how those guys got started. It was like – it was just knockoffs of knockoffs. Like yeah, I think they basically started as – they were working with Breeder Steve and ended up with a bunch of Breeder Steve genetics. So they started – I don't know what the story was, but uh, that's definitely Federation – had a lot it was a lot of like grapefruit and sweet skunk and the stuff that steve was working with and they definitely but i think they did some real work and they brought some other stuff like they were doing ubc chemo which was kind of a unique one and there's some other ones like berlin and some like kind of more bc centric ones i'm trying to think who the other ones jordan of the island is still around i've never do heard you, do you remember bc that. do you remember a company called bc grown uh, I do not. It was, it was I don't like think I remember that one. Um, it was early, early to mid two thousands. It was a dude named Jordan who ran it, and I've always tried to figure out if that was Jordan from the same person. Yeah, because it was it was a lot of the same stuff, a lot of the Godba and stuff like that. Because I just you know I I I come from an era where like uh, you know basically like all those waves. You know, um, I can't tell you how many times I read Neville's catalogs or Sensi's catalogs or the Dutch catalogs or all the stuff in cannabis culture, you know, all the various stuff that Mark Emery would sell from the various seed companies and their descriptions. Um, because there wasn't obviously like there wasn't, there wasn't internet, you know, so much, and there wasn't like a, a vibrant clone trading community and it was all very tight in your circles. And so if you wanted stuff outside your circle, you would peruse the seed lists and see what sounded cool. You know? Yeah, for sure. And I, the one thing I will say that, in my opinion, came out of that scene, I, I couldn't prove it, but I would lay bets that it did, was um, the auto, I honestly think the auto flowers all came out of Canadian genetics. So if you look at the sequence of events, this is one that I may be a little bit biased to because I was kind of close to a lot of parts of it, but there was originally, there was that, which you guys probably heard, that Mighty Might strain was kind of big oh, yeah. back then. And Mighty Might was... Um, it came from one of the Gulf Islands, which is one of the little islands between between the, just off the coast of BC. It was kind of that area had a lot of like uh, draft dodgers and like kind of dropout people would kind of go live on those islands. And yeah. it is actually a guy that I know's dad whose group that was growing that. And uh, who knows if it, if it, what it actually was? It was supposedly like a Himalayan, and it's like this really it's like got a really big, really indica, really strong central cola. And some of the phenos would go off automatically. Um, and if you trace back in Canada, anyways, if you trace back pretty much every time somebody's like talking about some super early strain, most of them come back to Mighty Might. You can just, it's one of those ones you can just look at it and you're like, that's got Mighty Might in it. I had a friend of mine sent me a picture a couple of years ago. And he's like some t acclimated Thai strain he had. He's been passed down through the generations. Too, and I took one look, I'm like, that's Mighty Might. Um, <laughs> but my, uh, my old partner used to do a lot of uh, so kind of I think where that got popularized is um, in Mark Emery was selling some seeds of it. And at the time, um, my old partner was doing these crazy grows of it. They had uh, 
up in northern Ontario. They were like living up in this cottage and they had, and so that was back then you could sell outdoor really easily. And uh, they were doing these crazy outdoors in these swamps. And uh, and it was all, it was kind of like, I'd almost describe it as a land race. So they were kind of back and forth between that Nelson area and BC. So they'd kind of have like the best outdoor stuff that was going around Nelson. And they were crossing it all with their own stuff, which was all pretty mighty might. And it would go off really early. Like you'd start harvesting in like July. And uh, yeah. not all of it, but it was like, it was kind of like a yeah. land race. So they would, they would pop like, you know, 1,500 or 2,000 seeds and grow them out in all these swamps all over the place. And, uh, and they would basically start harvesting like July. The first ones would come and they'd go all the way into like the first week of October. It was just like very, that's why I kind of call it. It's like a Canadian land race because it was just yeah. pretty diverse. And some of them were really good. And it, you could never get away with it then because you sell bags of it. I remember one of my buddies used to wholesale bags. And he's like, I can't take any more of this stuff. He's like, one guy tells me how great it is. And the next guy's telling me it like, doesn't do anything. And it was because it was all from seed. And it, some of it was the auto flower stuff that wasn't that strong. But that <laughs> anyway, so at the time, that was when I was writing for uh, – uh, cannabis culture mark emery's magazine i was writing for the cannabis culture magazine and i wrote an article about auto flowers because at the time i found it frustrating because there was definitely like some not like super good auto flowers but like decent quality like flower for the time like you could sell it wholesale no problem and yeah. uh so i wrote an article about uh auto flowers and it focused a lot on mighty might and at the time there was literally not a single auto flower on the market other than a few of those mighty mites coming out of mark emery's seeds like other than that, I don't think a single thing had been released since Neville released those first ones, like back in the eighties. Well, I guess yeah. sorry, Sensi still would have had that their crappy whatever it was called that nobody bought. Uh, uh, the Ruderalis, every, Ruderalis, yeah, yeah. Ruderalis yeah. Skunk and Ruderalis NL. And yeah. I was kind of frustrated because I was like, no, like this is actually has potential the auto flower stuff. So I wrote that article about it, and it was like within a year. That all of a sudden you started. That was kind of when I think the low rider came up. Low rider, yep. And then and then Europe all started doing auto flowers, and then auto I never dwarfs. really bothered with them. But they, yeah, they all it became a big thing. I honestly think I lay bets if you trace that back, whether it came from Mighty Might or something else, I would lay bets that came out of Canadian genetics because we were the only people really doing it much back then. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I I'm pretty certain that the timing all made sense. What didn't make sense to me was, the, um, if I remember correctly, Lowrider, the dude, uh, joint doctor, or whoever was the one that was originally saying they bred it, they said it was from a Mexican, just random Mexican. It's like, mm, I don't know, you know, like, because my, 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 I remember growing early sativa from Canadian bred seeds, and there were a few other ones. And they were definitely, they definitely had some good auto flowering traits back then. And there wasn't a lot being marketed at the time for auto flowering. One thing that's um, been pretty consistent in weed is obscuring the origin of where your stuff came from. Yeah. For a variety for of reasons. Certain. For certain. <clears throat> you know. That's, a, um, that's one of the yeah. more disappointing things of weed is when I've kind of, like, I travel a lot through Canada. So I kind of, um, like, just for work, I've always traveled a lot. And I've kind of, so I just know a lot of different people. And I've always kind of chased genetics a little bit and, and whatever. Just when you And when you dig into pretty much everything, you're just like, oh, it's just like another seed bank strain <laughs> or it's just yeah. renamed M39 or like it, there's so I can literally count on like one hand how many like elite things or stuff that have a great story that when you dig into them aren't are anything actual unusual. Yeah. That's it. That's that's typically it, you know, um, and especially once you get past a certain point in the years too, it gets much worse. You know, when you're starting to realize that you're buying every, everything comes from one Spanish seed company during certain years, you know, that if you're buying Dutch stuff and it, it, it did take a big change um, and it's gotten much worse over the years. So, you know, I guess that's why a lot of us are still chasing some of these old ones. It's not necessarily because we think they're more dank, but the, the genetic diversity is a lot better than just gelato times gelato or cookies times cookies times cookies times cookies or whatever time to get back yeah for cookies. sure and there was definitely some stuff when i think back that just was really unique compared to what's around whether people would actually care that much these days i don't know but it was definitely um unique yeah i think i, I really don't have a place pardon me unique definitely has a place now i think um at least among some circles that are left when, when I think of what's actually that I've tried that's unique over the years, it's always, and I'm not like a big sativa 
you know, dude. Uh, but uh, it's usually sativa stuff. It's like more equatorial stuff that's kind of distinct. Like when I think back to like growing up, it was like the Jamaican was kind of the Jamaican import we'd always get was definitely like pretty unique. Um, but it's just kind of stuff like that. It's like I think a lot of the Kushes and Indicas are pretty similar. I, I don't know. I'm sure maybe oh, yeah. somewhere in Afghanistan there's some different stuff. But everything I've really tried in that realm all seems pretty similar. So uh, in that regard, I mean, and maybe some of that, too, is just because sativas are the rarest thing to get worked uh, because indicas are definitely like easier to grow and they're shorter and they're thicker and they yield more and they're more prone for ins. Yeah. Um, so they kind of a lot of sativas sort of missed like this inbreeding era of the last 20 plus years, I think, you know, they weren't they weren't as, as big of a proponent of all that. Where Yeah, it's. It's pretty noticeable. I have one of my best friends grows out a, I would argue, probably more sativas than almost anyone like in North America. Like he's just a hobby guy, but he's just always like he pops. I bet he probably pops like a couple of thousand seeds a year of all like land race or whatever. It, it, oh, wow. know, all the ties. So I, so I try a lot of stuff from him, and it's really noticeable. It's just how like unimproved it is. Like it's just like it, a lot of it. I'm like, oh, that totally has like potential, but it's just like. When you really think of like, it's just really unworked and it's just like, yeah. doesn't have like, it's just, there's a lot of things missing and you're like, well, man, if somebody worked on this for 30 years, which is, you know, it's at least that what a lot of those coaches have been worked on, who knows what crazy stuff they could come out of them. But I just find it's pretty unworked because I try a lot of stuff from him and not very much of it is very appealing. Yeah. Cannabis doesn't breed itself naturally towards like getting humans high the best. <laughs> as we've seen you know it tends to like try to breed itself towards hempiness uh so it makes a lot of sense and i think a lot you know there's a there's a big land race heirloom collection community you'll see it on ig you know like the uh people offering you know strains directly from afghanistan and pakistan and and that's great but i i don't know that the the larger community in general understands what getting into land races and heirloom lines truly means and the kind of space you need to to truly pick something wonderful out that that many people would enjoy you know it's it's a much bigger process yeah I think that that's one of the things i think that a lot of more younger people don't get is like i'm like I've, I've grown up some land races but even like if you look back to old stuff um used to be around even if it's been domesticated like if you go back to a lot of the seed banks it's horrible like, more than keepers out of packs like yeah there was some great stuff that came out of that but the consistency these days like you can buy most of the modern stuff like you could buy a pack of almost anything and find like something great out of 10 seats and i think yeah. that was not the case back a long time you know in pretty recent history even when i go through that that sweet skunk clone that i grew out a lot of and uh that was basically like i'm pretty sure it's just a plain old nl ac and if you pop like hybrids of that and you see like a lot of like the old NL5 expressions, which everyone always talks about how great they are. I mean, they were horrible. They were super Botrytis um, susceptible. Um, it, it definitely has some nice stuff in there, but I'm like, I don't remember like the last time I popped like a pack of modern seeds and got something like rotted out on the, you know, on the stem under normal grow room conditions. But that was pretty common back then. Yeah. Oh, I definitely think that, uh, I talk about it uh, quite a bit, like the difference between like a, a low. Uh oh, can you hear Francis? No, he's all frozen. Okay, so we'll uh, probably pause it for a second until he comes back, since he's in the middle of something, and then I'll cut it. There my he is. My connection has been cutting in and out strangely. I don't know what the okay, deal is. Okay, leave but... a few seconds before you jump back in, so I can edit it. One, two, three. So I, I definitely noticed that like a lot of the original strains, you could find real gems in it, but it did take a lot of hunting and a lot of work. And I'm not sure that like the modern seed poppers would be comfortable going through stuff that had so much junk and mids. I mean, why would to they find though? the right thing? Yeah, it, it, You don't have to spend that time or space anymore to find something that, that, fills that modern market like that that palette so it, it's 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 a lot to go out of ask someone to go out of their way to, to do these massive pops it costs money time and space 
and it's harder to sell now. Like back then, you remember they could sell whatever, whatever you popped out of that seed pack, someone was lined up to buy it. I mean, I wouldn't want to try to move in some of that stuff these days. Like it's, I don't even know what you do with it. Make extracts, I guess, but brownies and extracts. <laughs> So now that we're getting into, we, we talked a little bit about botrytis on buds and, and some of the stuff there. Now, one of your specialties is IPM, and we really haven't covered a good IPM topic on on the show. So I wanted to I wanted to go over some basic steps um, and, and some of the practices that you do to 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 keep your room clean to to really work on your IPM. Do do you want to talk about some of your basics? <laughs> Yeah, so I kind of like I've worked. I, started, I worked in the commercial greenhouse industry for like a, a long time, like thirty years or something. And most, a lot of what I've done is in integrated pest management. So, yeah. also, I would say don't always take lessons from me on how to do stuff because because I work in that. Sometimes I go through stages where sometimes I'm like a super diseaseophobe and I'm like I don't want to take anything in, and uh, and other times I'm like whatever. If I get something, I want to. I don't really care that much if I get something in because I want to like figure out, like make sure I know what I'm talking about with getting rid of it. Sure. Um, and I, the only ones that honestly, out of all the ones that I see, the ones that is just like, really like the number one thing I say is just don't get it. <laughs> like, yeah, and right? some, some, like that's the easiest thing. Like thrips and spider mites to me, they're pretty easy to get rid of. The ones that are just like, they're, they're disastrous is like, is, I mean, powder mill is pretty, it's, doable but it's i mean it's anyone has had it it's pretty hard to shake especially if you've got a bigger operation yeah. um but the worst ones is uh, cannabis aphid uh in root aphid but just because they're there's just unless you're going to go with this they're easy to get rid of with a synthetic like mm -hmm. a systemic uh but if you're like legal and you can't do that or you don't want to do that they are essentially impossible to get rid of so i mean that and that's the one i always find so frustrating because people it's like they're you know, aphids are big. Like you can see them. You don't even need a hand lens, like a magnifying yeah. glass. You can see them with your naked eye. And I, I've seen, I've personally seen multiple times where people have literally like brought in like some stupid clone. It definitely wasn't worth the hassle and ended up with like, you know, something that cost them millions and millions of dollars. And they basically it's never get rid of them. Um, but I, I actually just had a recent one that I've kind of moving. So I'm kind of shutting down all my, like, so I'm not, finishing out my flowering and it, I was like okay well I'm just holding mothers for like the next you know probably a year or something because I gotta you know sell my house and move and stuff so I'm like yeah. I'm gonna start catching some clones that people owe me or whatever now's the time I'll add them and then I don't really care whatever if somebody sticks me then I'd, I got a year to clean it up and yeah. uh so I got, I got, and everyone that's given me a clone recently is going to be like, oh, that's me. But because I'll tell everyone, I've gotten a whole bunch of clones from different people in the last month or so. So it might not have been you. But somebody gave me powder and mildew on one of them that they told me didn't have any. Yeah. And I had left them. Uh, I'd gone traveling for two weeks. I thought it was fine and I left it. And then I went back, I kind of left my wife in charge and I came back and that one clone had blown up and gone everywhere. So now I got mildew everywhere so that one's fresh in my mind and that's the one that i think causes a lot of people a lot of uh there's a lot of they don't really understand what's going on there and yeah. i think they, they think it's systemic which is a chance it is but i think mostly what happens where you get it and they're like i just can't shake it it's just because once you get spores everywhere in your room they're basically impossible to get rid of like they last for years yeah. so i've seen i've seen that a bunch of times where people they think they've got it all under control and then bang like six months later PM starts up again. And I think that's really, it might've been that it was in some, you know, one of their plants just had a bit living on it that they didn't catch. But I think a lot of times it's just, there's spores everywhere. And sooner or later you kick up a spore and, and it germinates on your plant and, and bang, you've got it. But in that situation, I'd lay bets that what had happened is that plant that I brought in from my buddy had, was covered in spores yeah. and the spores kind of, you know, they germinate, on the plant and then they kind of have a little tap root that goes down into the plant that's called a historium that basically like it's kind of like roots for powdery mildew and yeah. it just like kind of sits there and it spreads like it's mycelium kind of across the surface so it's growing on the leaf surface and then what triggers 
powdery mildew, like what people notice is when this when it spores, when it sporulates, right? And yeah. a lot of times what people think it's like a humidity thing, but usually when it actually sporulates, it's a stress event. So it's either that's why you see it in like peak flowering, all of a sudden it'll go you'll see a whole room go off with mildew you didn't think you had. And in this case, while I was traveling, the you know, in Canada, usually when it switches from kind of summer to fall, it'll go from like eighty five percent relative humidity on average down to like thirty five when yeah. the cool weather, when the cool front hits. And that's what I think happens. It was a cool front hit while I was traveling and bang, this thing went off. My wife didn't see it. And next thing I know, I've got mildew all over the, all over the, uh, all over the garden, but definitely like those ones. So I, I guess my biggest thing is I, I'm usually pretty careful. Like definitely if I was running a commercial thing, I would be way the heck more careful than pretty much everybody in what I bring in. That's pretty sure. much all the time where it comes from. It's people importing clones. And I mean, it, the one that just really gets me, it's the, it's the aphids. It's the cannabis aphids especially. Like they're just so easy to see. And I think especially with the legal stuff, people start bringing in like, you know, more cuttings at a time than they can look through yeah. properly. And then it only takes one aphid. And then, you, you, you know, but like one cannabis aphid in three weeks can take down like a whole garden, basically. Like it really, they reproduce that quickly. For the um, for the PM, what what in Canada? Uh, I you know because I know down here like our crew tends to use like micronized sulfur spray, but I don't even know like in the legal market if that's something they can even use up in Canada. Is that something you guys use there? Or do you have a different routine? Uh, yeah, so no, they can use it. So basically, what they're limited to, and again, because I I kind of work in both. I've worked for a long time in also like commercial uh, vegetables and commercial flowers. So I've been yeah. I kind of know what's dealt with in general and what's different with cannabis is in any other crop it's always controlled by a combination of systemic fungicides and stuff like sulfur and you know potassium bicarbonate or like bacillus subtilis or stuff like some of the common things and what we've got stuck with in canada good or bad i'm not i don't really have a comment whether it's good or bad but it makes it challenging is there's there's no like systemic fungicides registered so basically once you take the systemic out you're just dealing with surface level um other than sulfur maybe you're just re dealing with surfer, surface level controls so yeah. for instance like you know people will use like uh i think rhapsodies one like a bacillus subtilis which is like a bacterial one yeah. that people that's a common one i think they use on both sides of the border and it works great but it only controls like the surface level so it's and it, so it's not controlling that hostarium that's down in the, that little root that's down into the plant. Exactly. Um, so basically you can kill everything on the surface and then that little root's just going to keep, it's just, you know, a week yeah. later you're going to pop up and slowly spread again and you won't see it until it sporulates. So basically what they're stuck with in any of the legal places is just spraying every week um, to keep the, once you've got mildew in your facility, they just spray every week with, Usually they rotate. They've got, it's, I think there's a hydrogen peroxide type spray. There's a potassium bicarbonate spray. There's a couple of like oil type sprays, which again, these are all just ones that they're just like, they surface. control the surface level. The only thing that really has any systemic effect is sulfur. Mm -hmm. And that's one that people, and I honestly don't know the real answer to this bubble. I, I will say for sure, all the cleanest growers that I've seen in the legal market use a lot of sulfur. They use sulfur, literally some of them use it, right, they use sulfur pots right to harvest. Yeah. I'm not saying that's good or bad. They will argue, um, I personally wouldn't use it that far. They argue if you look at the sulfur tests, like the leaf, uh, like the tissue analysis, sure. there's still not enough sulfur in the plant. That's their argument. They're just like, it's just a plant nutrient. They're still not up to optimal levels, even with the pots burning. Mm -hmm. um, bubble man and i honestly just don't know which is true on this bubble you know a lot of people will say that the sulfur gets into and will destroy the flavor which i could definitely see you know what sulfur yeah, is yeah. like it just gets into everything and bubble man back years ago he used to be the buyer at the vancouver compassion club and that was his big thing was he would make hash with it and he could smell the salt tell whether somebody had used defender on it, their crop and i would say definitely some of that had to be bullshit because i've literally smoked that guy that the one of the big LPs that I know for a fact runs it r literally yeah. until harvest day. I bought some of their uh, pink Kush. Literally, I know exactly what was done to it. And I bought it from the legal store. It was covered in sulfur. I could do anything. 
Yeah. So, I don't know. I personally am sus, a little sus on it. But sulfur is definitely like the most effective thing out of those. And then what I find it kind of gets is a little bit dumb is like we had, I think you guys did too, that whole uh, Michael Butinal thing when, when yes. it first went legal. Yeah. There's a few people, uh, it's called Nova up here. I can't remember what you guys call it. Um, Eagle 20. Fun, Eagle 20. That's right. Yeah. So, th- so a bunch of guys got caught using that. And there's this whole thing about how it makes like some, you know, when you smoke Eagle 20, it makes this cyanide. I think it was some, some super yeah. toxic sounding thing. But then if you look in, and I'm not telling people to go use Eagle 20, but yeah, I'm just saying, yeah. I think it's been blown up a little, a lot. So if you look at like the, the chemical that they were all talking about, that was so bad. Well, cannabis already produces it like a thousand times the level that was in the Michael Butinal um, spray. So I don't, I'm not advocating that people use Michael Butinal. I'm just saying that that is how it's controlled on other crops. And sure. I would argue, like, I personally wouldn't have a problem doing clones with Michael Butinal and like knowing like, I personally wouldn't have a problem cleaning up mother's stock with Michael Butinol. I would never use it in flour and stuff like that. Sure. Even though we eat it all the time. I'm like, 100% yeah. of all your food's covered in this stuff. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we got a, some weird stuff there. It's the same kind of thing with aphids in Canada where it's really easy to get aphids. I've seen both with Michael Butinol and with aphid uh, systemic chemicals where I've seen people test clean pretty not that far after they've done that, that application. Yeah. Um, and it literally makes like it's literally with cannabis aphid. It's, it's it seems like one of those dumb things where I've seen like these LPs that literally have spent like, you know, 13 million dollars on biocontrol for a year to control cannabis to control cannabis aphid. And they could have literally controlled them with like one, you know, endeavor treatment um, yeah. for like a penny or something like that. You get it seems like it's gotten a little bit crazy. Like it's like, OK, but who? Who really cares if it tests? As long as it tests clean, do you really care whether somebody used it in their mother's stock? So I, I'm kind of always a pretty big IPM. I don't really believe in pure biocontrol or pure chemical. But I kind of believe in both. I don't yeah. really see a big problem with a lot of some of that stuff. If it's test, if you're testing it and it's clean at the end of the day, who cares? So, so the issue with that, with that, what happens is any of those powdery mildew. That's just a general issue with a lot of chemicals. Is stuff gets resistant to them really quick. There, there is back. So I was just saying, uh, not so like what. So what happens with stuff like that is it's just when you, they're spraying it too frequently and it just gets resistant to it. And what? So Canada's got a lot more stringent pesticide laws than the U.S. So we've kind of always used a lot more, um, you know, biocontrol and like. Uh, micro like uh, biopesticides so that where they would use if you look at a conventional cucumber crop that gets a, a huge amount like way more mildew than the cannabis crop gets they would yeah. always rotate so they'll sit there and they'll spray potassium bicarbonate or like these soft, soft stuff which you can't get rid so you can't get rid of for you can't get resistant to potassium bicarbonate um so they'll spray those every week and then every once in a while They'll throw in a Nova that kind of just knocks the crap out of them. And that's how they manage the resistance. Um, same thing with biocontrols. Like you were talking about, you know, your spider resistor mites. That's how a lot, a lot of crops are just, they use the biocontrols to spread out how often they're going to do the spray treatment just to keep them much more effective. I mean, yeah. In, in Mendo as well, 20 years ago, you could spray, people would use abamectin. Some people call it Avid or whatever else. And they would spray it once and they wouldn't see a two spot for a year. Um, and then people got to the point where they would spray, they would dip their cuttings in it every run. They would overuse it to a point where there's a lot of mites in Northern California that are immune to quite a number of the harsher chemicals. Well, I mean, like 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 Darwolf was saying, I, I mean, uh, the main introduction is by bringing in new clones. If they're only seen it once a year, it's probably because they're only bringing in new clones once a year to replace the old stock and bringing in the new spider mites with well, it. I think for I spider think mites specifically. Be... Go ahead, Darwolf. Oh, I was just going to say for spider mites, and maybe, maybe it's different because you're definitely in – California is a very agricultural and intense area. So, but where I, where I live, I live in an area that's basically the size of like Ukiah, but it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's got like 3000 acres of greenhouse. In it. So it's just like solid greenhouses um, and lots of different people own them. So there's, there's, it's, I would argue at least as agriculturally intensive as Mendo is and everyone's spraying different stuff. 
And what I've seen a bunch of times, like I'll tell you, a friend of mine owns a big cucumber greenhouse and he had the same story that Nato was saying, basically, like when I first uh, was going in there, he was literally like tank mixing, like, you know, six times the rate of Avid with 10 <laughs> times the rate of Floramite, something literally, I'm not even making those numbers up. Like it was yeah, crazy yeah, yeah. amounts of stuff. And, uh, and that would basically buy him like five days. Like he was just in a mad panic spraying over and over and over again. And yeah. So he switched to using biocontrol for that. And within three months, um, you could, and again, I'll just I'm going to elaborate on this a little bit, but within three months, you could go in there with a regular rate of fluoromite or a regular rate of avid. And it looked like you dropped a nuclear bomb in there. Like you'd spray once and it was, it would just like wipe everything out. And but, so there's two things that can kind of go on with pest populations is the majority of what I've seen, especially with spider mites, is like it's a it's a short term selection pressure. So as soon as you take that selection pressure, which maybe is spring avid all the time, away for a while, <clears throat> there's nothing selecting for that in the population. So it just goes back to being susceptible. You do get sometimes if you look at other pests like uh, white flies. A good example. There's a type of uh, white fly uh, from down from southwest. It comes from southwestern U.S. And it comes from those really agricultural intense areas where they're getting sprayed a lot. And in those cases, the, there's a lot of resistance to insecticides. It's actually become fixed in the population where it doesn't matter. It's just like every single one. Just like if you're breeding auto flowers and you got to the point where everything is auto flower, well, you can't yeah. breed that out. But I haven't seen that a lot. I, I, it's definitely possible with mites. I have not seen it. I've seen it with white fly. And that's a about it. It definitely could happen with other stuff, but most of the resistance is generally local. It's generally because the like the people on that farm have been overusing. A yeah, makes sense. I, I what I what I find in Mendo is when because spider mites breed more rapidly when the temperatures go up and the humidity goes down. Um, people tend to like you know, especially inside and stuff like that. They really tend to get beat up in summertime. And then they tend to get ahead in winter and they lose again in summer. Um, and, you know, and, and then there's a lot of things, too, where people used to overuse all those chemicals, especially when in the 215 era, the clubs only tested for parts per million. Uh, people had it figured out, like how close you could use certain chemicals and still test clean when you took your product in. And then they moved it to parts per billion. Uh, and that changed things a bunch. Um, and you know, and so now obviously all those things are banned and you can't use them at all. Um, and so, you know, people have, have gone to biocontrol or they've gone to pet, they've gone to bugs, they've gone to like simpler methods, I think, you know, uh, Which, with varying that's, degrees. That's definitely what, that's definitely what's happened in Canada with the legal market. It just generally everyone uses as much like there's definitely some people spraying some nasty stuff in the black market, but most of them are pretty, um, they use, they, they're pretty IPM, like they're using a lot of benefit, uh, biocontrol. But the one that I just find, there's just, there's some things that biocontrol just doesn't have a great answer to. And cannabis aphid is one that is just, it has great answers. Like there's tons of stuff that will control cannabis aphid really well they're they'll never get rid of them 100 percent and they're you know it gets expensive um there's some that i'm just like i personally just can't envision like long term not like there's just not going to be a biocontrol that's going to control them cost effectively and so i mean um there's a couple like that but most of them are pretty pretty uh control i think probably what you've got going on in mendo is a climate thing too where it's just really yeah 100 percent uh, bad climate like where where it'd be hard to make biocontrols work properly because you got really low humidity all the time um but sorry the other thing i was going to mention with the spider mites that one of the most common things that, that i see is spider mites they go into hibernation under short days so they go into what's called diapause and so basically what i see happen is really common is someone will get bad spider mites and then they think they got rid of them but just, you know, a whole bunch of the population is just like hiding, you know, in their electrical outlets and, you know, any little crevice in your room in diapause. And they'll do that, like, kind of, so basically, they're going to go cycle just in and out of diapause. So they might disappear for like two months up into your room somewhere. And then you think it's all clean. 
And then bang, you're like, where did all these spider mites come from? And that's what it was. Little you know, bastard. They were just in diapos. Cannabis aphids, I can say for, for Mendo, um, it's really the first new pest that I've seen in probably the last, you know, them and russet mites, honestly, are only are the two new things that have come along really within the last like five to seven years. Um, yeah, for sure. Sorry, go ahead. And, you know, and cannabis aphids, I've had experience with lots of other types of aphids before. Um, cannabis aphids just breed so unbelievably fast. Um, and they're all female and they all are pregnant and their and their embryos have embryos. So they just replicate at such a rate. Like you were saying, there's lots of things that kill them. But you miss a couple and give it a few weeks and they'll be back to crazy levels again. Yeah, just to, like it there. I don't think most people just grab. I can't tell people enough times like don't get them they're literally the worst thing you could ever have like so i'll give you an example of just how bad they are is i had just on a personal grow so i was doing some uh we were doing some trials somewhere for work for cannabis aphid and i must have had to come from here but i must have ended up with one on my clothes and it couldn't have been more than one or two aphid because i don't even think like i would never walk right from a place like that into my grow room so but somehow a cannabis aphid can that was the only place it could have come from so cannabis aphid can only go from cannabis plants right so if you're like whatever living in somewhere where there's no cannabis plants around and you got cannabis aphid like you brought them in on cuttings 100 percent um or or like someone dumb like me brought them in on their clothes from a place that had cannabis aphid and at the time so i was just playing around with everything and you could control them to kind of like low you could keep them at a dull roar pretty easily with soaps or bio controls or like we were using lace wing. I did a bunch of different stuff. It wasn't hard to keep them fairly under control, but to get rid of them was next to impossible because you literally have to get rid of every single one. Um, and I literally had to take my entire collection down to um, like four little clones and spray them almost to death with silk to get rid of them until they were entirely clean like they're so on a commercial thing it's basically impossible you could never um i don't think it's possible to get rid of them the one thing i would say that i have seen and i don't know what the exact answer to them is is uh heat treatments so with the crop in um i've seen it the only people i've seen actually get rid of them completely used it did uh via heat treatments uh but maybe if we can back up a little bit so why they're so bad compared to you know, a lot of people, you'll get like an aph aphids on your cannabis crop and then they don't do anything. That's like pretty common. So a lot of pests are, they, they're adapted to the crop species. So for instance, on tomatoes, don't get a whole lot of uh, aphids. And most, most times on a tomato crop in a greenhouse, you'll get um, aphids that'll come in and they just don't, they kind of get going a little bit and then they just disappear by themselves. And it's because they don't like the host plant. And every once in a while, you'll get one that's adapted. And then it's like, look out, it's basically the same as cannabis aphid. And with cannabis aphid, it's just highly adapted to that um, that crop. So as soon as they get going, they're, they'll go like um, they'll go like crazy. But yeah, if you go back to the heat treatment, that's one of the things that actually came from the black market where, I don't know, but in general, but I was who's kind of spread that around in Canada. Um, and I got it from the black market. I knew some black market people that were getting, you can get these heaters that they use in hotel rooms uh, to kill bed bugs. So basically if you heat up a room to like, you know, about 45 or 50 Celsius um, for about five hours, it'll kill everything that's in there. Um, and some guys were in the black market, were playing around for that for broad might. Um, and it doesn't work by the way. Um, but we also play, ended up playing around with it for cannabis aphid, and it does work pretty well. So the and I the thing is like you can really master crop cranking those temperatures. And the guys that I know that have figured it out, obviously they won't tell anyone what they did, but it's something to do with heat treatments. And it's something with playing around with like those high temperatures, like forty five Celsius or something, for a few hours enough to um, make them all dehydrated so there's definitely answers that i think will get figured out because i've definitely seen a few people that have that have done it but uh yeah the, for most people i'm like just take a good look at your cutting before you bring that into your your place because they spread so quick you know they they can actually in california they transfer by air um 
you know, from just different, cause there's so many outdoor gardens. And really what happened to us is it was Oregon's fault is Oregon had hundreds and hundreds of acres of hemp. Once we made hemp legal through the farm bill uh, federally, and then the hemp market, the CBD market collapsed and people had th literally thousands of acres of hemp uh, that was going to be worthless. And so they didn't implement any IPM. And some of these cannabis aphids took over and just replicated at a rate that was never before seen. And then they just started spreading like wildfire from there. Oh, th yeah. So basically, that's exactly what's happened. Is can so cannabis aphid needs to go from a cannabis plant to a cannabis plant. And generally, it's, I've seen most of the time it's from cut is from imported cuttings but you can definitely get that so basically when they they don't usually have wings but when they run out of food um a food source or there gets too many they'll develop wings and fly somewhere else so yeah if you've got a lot of growers near you um, or hemp fields and stuff you'll get flyers um root aphids actually worse so at least with those ones like with cannabis aphid you're like okay well at least if you, you know if you're away from everybody else or if you screen your greenhouse or screen your grow room, like do a good job in your grow room, you're probably not going to get them in. Even if you didn't screen them, you're probably not getting them in your grow room from like a hemp field unless you're like intaking directly out of the outside. But uh, root aphids, the problem is they're actually worse because they're an actual quite a widespread pest that lives on a lot of different plants. So you can uh, get root aphids from, I don't know, the, all the host species, but you can just get them from like weeds outside your place. So that's, but it's interesting because I'm the same thing as like when I grew up, most of the time it was just like, it was, you know, thrips and spider mites up until PM, the whole PM outbreak kind of blew up, I'm guessing probably on 2000s or something. Um, yeah. And then all these new ones, the, you know, hemp russet mite, uh, cannabis aphid root aphid and then obsolete and viroid they're all like came out of a legal thing it was just from increased sharing of genetics material for sure it was very poor practices and it was people stopping maintaining their own mothers and then and then buying and trading amongst their small group of friends and then going to centralized locations like dispensaries or stores or nurseries and just for the ease of getting their plant stock somewhere. Well, you yeah, know, we I mean, sorry, go ahead. Okay. No, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, originally what we saw was just from people, it was just from, you know, black market channels opened up more and people were sharing clones a lot more than they used to. Because like, for instance, in that, uh, um, that Nelson, BC area, that was where hep rusted mite first showed up in Canada that I saw. And that was from clones that came out of Colorado. Um, that got brought up. Um, but I'd say in Canada where the bigger problem has been, it's, it's in the nursery thing was kind of stage two of that where now, because it's so legal, most people are buying from nurseries and it's like, whatever the new hype clone is, you got to get it from this one nursery. And then like people are buying it. I'm like, dude, don't buy it from that place. Like you're going to get all kinds of stuff and they buy it anyways and all of a sudden they've got you know cannabis aphid and pops latent and everything else coming from it so that's definitely been the second wave is those those legal nurseries which is i think what you guys are seeing in california a lot too that was what i was going to comment on was the the legal nursery aspect um like you know different different nurseries specifically in california when a hype strain would go off there would be one major clone nursery supplying millions of those clones to all the different dispensaries out there and if HLV was just in one, it takes no effort at all to just ruin every room that it touches. So yeah, that's been a massive explosion. The, the secondary nurseries, the legal nurseries, all that uh, major pathogen vector. The thing with, with tops latent is it's, and again, I've never dealt, I've seen it. I've had a bunch of buddies that have had it pretty well. And I kind of know I've dealt with other like, uh, you know, vegetable crop viruses and star viroids that are similar to that. And viroids are usually really easy to control because the nice thing about them is like they can't persist outside of like plant sap. So they're not going to just sit on your like, you know, floor for a long period of time and then reinfect like a lot of us. So when you see those people, it's just like everything they're shipping has got hops latent for you. Like they're doing something seriously wrong. Like it's just really bad. What, all it what, is. I, what, I, what I think happened is uh, people, you know, uh, people would use similar scissors or similar razors um, or, you know, uh, cloning 
would spread it really badly, I think, in a lot of those nurseries. And it would go from being on just a few plants to being on hundreds. Yeah, almost all the hops latent viroid, in my opinion. There's definitely some that's been spread from seed. But I think the vast majority has just been spread from, you know, some dude using the same cutting knife on everything. Yeah, it seems to be how it's it's rapidly spread and, and the, the water uh, liquid contact between root systems. It sounds like that's another vector. That that was a new one that I heard when on your guys when when you had that lady on. It was interesting to me because I'm like, man, that makes it. Well, I don't doubt it either, but I'm like, man, that makes I've it a whole it. lot worse. I've watched it happen in action. It's it's you know, pretty crazy. Yeah, and then she, you know, one of the interesting things she brought up was just how like leaf tissue it could be hit or miss whether or not it showed up on testing. But root tissue, it was like a hundred percent. If if you had it, it was going to show up on if you ripped off some roots and tested those, um, and how it moved through the plant, you know. So, and we've definitely had buddies. We called it dudding back then. I don't know if it was hop latent, but we definitely have had buddies that like it ripped through their whole scene, basically through runoff. That was what yeah. that yeah, was. That, that was how it got. That one's new to me. I, I, it's, that was a really good episode that you guys, like that interview. She had some really interesting information that I hadn't uh, uh, heard before. It totally makes sense, but that's uh, it's it's kind of a different um, thing because most it's not something you see in a lot of other cases. Because, for instance, like in you know greenhouse vegetables, everything's getting run through like all the run like they do recirc, but I mean everything's getting it's there's not a lot the way they're set up everything just goes right, you know, they're all in Rockwell slabs and it just basically goes directly out of that one slab into the, you know, the runoff cat gutter. And then it gets mm -hmm. run through like ozone treatment and everything. So you're not getting viruses recirculating like that. I think it's kind of like a, it's partly to do with how a lot of people are set up. Definitely takes yeah. a window to like the no-till dudes when you're, when you're like, well, crap, you get obsolete and viroid in there once and you're basically stuck with it. Dude, yeah. there was a, um, there was a thing, you know, the DNA was part of it. Um, uh, and they had, they were one of the first people that had like huge greenhouse scenes in Salinas, California, when legal first happened. And they did all these like two foot deep, five foot wide, hundred foot long beds everywhere and all these greenies. And they brought in root aphids on their plants very first run. And they basically infected these living soil beds with root aphids and then they struggled for a couple of years and then they went to one gallon pots and then it magically burned down yeah they couldn't get rid of them <laughs> i have I, I personally wouldn't do it i have one of my good friends who's a big living soil guy and i've actually seen him for sure i've seen root aphids in his place and they've never got going like i don't think he ever gets rid of them but they don't actually cause him any problem and he, and i think it is because the living soil kind of keeps them in check um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know a hundred percent on that. The one thing I would say on hops latent viroid though, is like one of my friends, he runs a legal place that was the first one in Canada that I saw that got it re really bad. Like they had to like shut down the whole, they had like a new startup, got it all rolling. They did like one crop and we're like, what the heck is going on here? And they couldn't figure it out. And they finally, they were, there was before anyone really knew what hops latent viroid is. And he's like, dude, it was a disaster for them. Like, but he's like, it was actually super easy to control. He's like, literally, as soon as you got rid of the, they literally just got rid of all the plants. They didn't even sanitize. They literally threw all the plants out, waited a week, put fresh plants from a tissue culture in, and they've never had them again. And he's sometimes like, you could easily. That's it. Just, pardon me, Matt. That sometimes that's it. You know, some of our friends just said, throw it out, start over, the quickest way through it. And, well, it depends how you're set up, probably, now that you've got that whole runoff thing. Uh, yeah. Set up on Rockwell cubes, and, and they probably had, like, a research. Like I said, it's pretty standard in a lot of those sit-ups to have ozone in line that kills anything like that. So it's going to limit how much it's going to spread. But he said he could easily, he's like, if I had to do it again, I wouldn't even have pulled the crop. He's like, I just would have, like, watched, you know, maybe did a good job testing his mothers and then just going, oh, that one's got it. And he's just, he's just like, just from sanitation, like don't use the same knife from plant to plant. And he's like, I'm totally confident that I could uh, have done it, but he's the one of the guys I know you were talking about, whether it could come from seed or not. I've seen firsthand the lab test that he got. So that was what was kind of sad about that whole thing is that dude threw out his whole clone collection when he started that licensed place. 
because he was worried about bringing in some weird pastor virus, bought in all fresh Cali seed and oh, started God. that whole legal place from there. And that's where his top latent viroid came from, for sure. And he showed Ooh. me test packs of, like, tests from some of the packs that he got that he tested positive. For, so there's no doubt some of them are getting transferred. Brutal. Oof. Brutal. Br- you know, she also mentioned, or I think someone in the chat at the time mentioned pollen. And it traveling on pollen, and I didn't. I had never even taken that into consideration. Like a dotted male pollen transfer, I don't know if it's possible, but I probably would. For is. for somebody like me, who ha- keeps a lot of uh, a lot of old a lot of old clones that are not currently popular, um, and it's hard to get people to back them up for you and help because if there's not a financial incentive, they're not particularly interested. Uh, it's really scary. Um, because there's there's some things that are really nice that aren't very well spread out um, and can get ruined. And I mean, we have good friends of ours that lost some pretty old and some pretty rare things um, before the hop latent thing was even known. We just called it dudding and people didn't know what precautions to take. Uh, and so I'm pretty worried about the combination of root aphids and russets and hop latent and and even stuff like, you know, the, that root aphids can spread hop latent. Yeah. I don't know that that's, I think they probably can. I don't know that that's actually been proven a hundred percent. Have you seen? I something? don't think so either, but, but I wouldn't but put it's it pretty likely. Them. It's pretty likely. So there's a lot of kind of myth about that. What I, my understanding is something like thrips or spider mites is really, they're not, thrips are vi- virus carriers, but from my understanding from this actually came from one of the someone that's like PhD guys in in virology, like they know way more than me, I do. They told me that there's the chance of thrips carrying hops latent viroid is almost next to nothing. Um, I think aphids is definitely quite likely, and it, even if it's like to me, everyone's right now so caught up in hops latent viroid, they forget like there's a million other viruses out there that are just as bad that for sure aphids carry and thrips carry some of them too. Um, but aphids are probably the number one, like virus vector in agricultural. Oh, crop. we've been getting, there's this stuff that's been spreading around beet curly top virus yep, and it gets spread it. by, it gets spread by leaf hoppers. Um, so there's, and that's one of actually one of one thing I'll mention, cause I think it matters is, you know, in the, in the old days, when everybody was hiding in, in, in small and medium sized indoors and everybody was up in the hills and tucked away, um, a lot of this stuff didn't spread so much. And now that we've gone legal and people are going into all these traditional ag areas to grow cannabis, all those traditional ag areas are rife with things that cannabis hasn't really grown next to yet. Yeah, and that's one of the things I don't think people like. I said I I live in a really agricultural intense area, so basically the area it's all just greenhouses and cornfields, and like it's we've got I think it's ninety seven percent clear cut for agriculture where I live. So what's interesting is I've seen it play out a bunch of times. Like for instance, like on tomatoes, tomatoes never used to get thrips. So greenhouse tomatoes they didn't get thrips, and then all of a sudden one year thrips were like this massive issue on tomatoes and they never went away. It just kept kind of continued. And if you trace back what it was, it was, they'd started growing wheat. And so in the fields around the greenhouses, they were growing wheat and wheat's got lots of pollen and thrips love it. So, cause there's like a food source. And so you get these giant levels of thrips right beside your greenhouse. And when you get a situation like that, and I've seen this with a bunch of different pests, most like 99% of the thrips don't like tomatoes. But sooner or later, you get one that does, and then or two that does, and then they breed, and all of a sudden, you've got thrips adapted uh, to tomatoes, and that's a whole different story. And that's anytime you get agricultural intense areas, that's what you get is these jumps of a pest that doesn't necessarily normally like cannabis or whatever. That when you you know when you grow you know ten gazillion white fly right beside a cannabis crop, sooner or later you know, a couple like cannabis and uh, they have babies and then bang, you got a whole new pest complex to deal with. It just sounds like a never ending cycle of pests, 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 and probably more are going to be entering into our cannabis sphere as it gets bigger, more corporate. Oh, certainly. More widespread. And goes yeah. into all those areas that have all those different pests and then life adapts, you know? Well, yeah. the one interesting thing, like a year, long time ago, I used to be a 
uh, flower grower. So I used to work at a really like a pretty big uh, ornamental greenhouse. And we grew like a lot of different types of flowers, like different species. And one of the more interesting things that I saw there is we always had like, you know, this type of this variety that always just was never happy. Right. And you were growing so many different things. You could never bait. Nothing was ever perfect. Right. And one year we were just like, we just took all the, we just did a broad sample for virus uh, for this specific virus, uh, just pretty. Co- I would lay bets this is a cannabis one as well. It was called uh, uh, INSV, impatient necrotic spot virus, and it's a thrips spread virus. And what was interesting is when we did a broad analysis of like all of our plants, all the plants, pretty much all the plants that we were like always having problems with, like I can't figure out why this one won't grow, or this one's always got pH problems, it looks like, or this they all had INSV. So it was all this, like, basically like 90% of all of our, what we thought was plant cultural problems was actually that it had a virus and doesn't necessarily show the same all the time. I would lay bets that's probably goes on in cannabis a lot. That Jesus. could be a lot. That could be a lot of what people call when people think about like genetic drift or clones get old and tired and they don't want to root well anymore and they don't want to grow well anymore. They could have just picked up some kind of pathogen that they don't have a way to detect. Well, I want to keep everything going, and I think we're going to have to do a whole other part two of this because it's going to cut us off right at two hours. And, yeah, I mean, I think we could do a whole other show out of all this. So uh, is there anything you want to plug before we're done? Yeah, I mean, it's good. Is there anything you'd like to plug, Dyer? No, I got nothing to plug, man. That was good. It was uh, good talking. It was an enjoyable chat for sure. Yeah, we could have kept going forever, except it's going to cut me off. And I hate that. <laughs> so we really appreciate having you, Dyer. Um, we're definitely going to have you back if you'll have us back and you'll be back on. And I'm sure everybody will be enjoying it. And uh, we appreciate all of your your tips and tricks with IPM. Uh, uh, it's one of the most requested things we get. Um, yeah, not so. You got anything you want to plug? Just always, I appreciate everybody's time, everybody listening and tuning in as we explore different stuff. So much appreciated. All right. Thanks everyone.